Hi, my name is Betty Hedges, and I'm going to talk today about monarch butterflies. I've been raising monarch butterflies for eight years, and I'm fascinated by it. A monarch butterfly is looks like this. It has orange wings with, with black veins. And uh, it has a very unique story in that it spends the summers in our country, and then in the winter, it spends the winter in Mexico. Now, a one mount butterfly can't do all that. So there's several generations of butterflies. In the early spring, the butterflies leave Mexico and the mountains of Mexico outside Mexico City, and they fly to the southern parts of the United States. They breed there, lay their eggs, the eggs hatch and the next generation comes around. And each generation gets a little farther north till around August, they can reach as far as Canada. And then in August, they start heading south again, back the last generation, usually it's the fourth generation, heads back to Mexico where it's never been, finds the same forests there to spend the winter and start, it, start the journey again. Now, monarch butterflies will only eat a particular type of plant. That is plants in the milkweed family. Milkweed family plants are, have the genus name Asclepias, A-S-C-L-E-P-I-A-S. There's many types of milkweed, so swamp milkweed and purple milkweed, butterfly weed are all types. But in my experience, the monarch butterflies prefer common, ordinary roadside milkweed. And that's what, this is what it looks like. It has pink flowers and they just smell beautiful. The leaves are, round, are oval, get pretty big. And then they have a pod, seed pods in the fall. When the seed pod opens up, you see all these little white fluffy seeds coming out. So the female butterfly lays her eggs underneath the leaf of the milkweed. And the seed is about, the egg is about the size of a sesame seed. In a few days, the egg hatches. The little bitty caterpillar eats the egg shell, and then it starts going to town on the milkweed leaf. In, the, in two weeks, it just eats all the time, and it grows 3,000 times as big as it was originally, until it gets about two inches long to a beautiful caterpillar that is white with yellow and black stripes. Then when it knows it's reached its full maturity, it finds a suitable twig to hang on to from its back end. It hangs on to that and it splits open its outer skin and forms the chrysalis. The chrysalis is a lovely green, jade green, thing hanging from the from the twig. Now inside the chrysalis, it's for two weeks, a complete transformation takes place. The caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And it's a remarkable and amazing process that nobody re has really studied to see, fully studied to see how it happens. But it does happen. And in two weeks or so, the chrysalis turns clear and you can see the monarch cat butterfly in there and then it's able to split open the chrysalis caging and comes out as a beautiful butterfly. It takes a few uh, hours to pump fluid into its wings to expand them and harden them and then it flies away. Now the mature butterfly doesn't eat. It has different mouth parts than the caterpillar, and it eat, drinks pollen from flowers. Some of the flowers it likes are our native flowers, such as asters and goldenrods. Butterfly bush is also used 
And then a favorite plant of mine for butterflies is buttonbush. It's a shrub and its flowers look like little round buttons with white spikes sitting out. And all butterflies just flock to this shrub. It grows very large, but if it's too big, if it grows too big, you can always cut it back in the winter to make it to control its size again. So that's buttonbush. Now I raise the monarchs in cages uh, and I put them on display in public libraries so people can see the process going on. And uh, you can do that in your home. You buy a special cage with screening on all the sides because you need good air circulation. And you bring in the monarchs either as eggs or as small caterpillars and you feed them milkweed every day and you have to clean them clean out the poop that the that they create which they do a lot of and uh, in about two weeks they become a chrysalis and you wait and uh, when they become a butterfly then you release them now monarch is one of our native butterflies and we want to encourage our native butterflies and bees and pollinators and there's certain gardening practices we can all do to encourage them to be here. First of all, don't use insecticides or pesticides or herbicides in your garden. Insecticides kill every insect. 90% of insects are beneficial. It's just a few that are damaging. If you have a plant that's being infested by an insect, you can call your extension service or your master gardeners and they can give you advice on what to do to control the infestation. Herbicides are also toxic to frogs, toads, and fishes. Then I also recommend that you remove the, non -in the invasive non-native plants. This includes Bradford pear, Norway maple, Russian olive, English ivy, winter creeper, burning bush, periwinkle, barberry, and spirea. Now, these all take the place of native plants, and they're not any benefit to any native insects or birds. So if you can take them out and put in native plants, you will be able to encourage more insect and bird life in your garden. And what do baby birds eat? Baby birds eat caterpillars, and the caterpillars are only found on native plants because the insects are only used to finding native plants to put their caterpillars, to lay their eggs for the caterpillars. If you want to have more, get more information on planting wildlife planting native plants in your garden to encourage wildlife. I re recommend the books by Douglas Talamay, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. He's a professor at the University of Delaware. And his books include Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. And if we all would remove one or two of our native, of our non-native plants every year, and replace them with a native plant, we would be creating much more habitat for our native insects and birds. And it doesn't have to be done all at once, and we don't have to remove all of our non-native plants. Everybody loves roses. Everybody, lots of people love peonies. I love peonies. There's a lot of flowers that we want to keep that are na not native, but if we can make the majority of the plants in our garden native plants, it will do a lot to help our native plant pollinators, birds, and insects. And there's always a native plant 
that can take a place of some exotic plant that's in your garden. There's always something that can be found to take the place of it. Now, if you also want to do more advice, you want to leave the dead stems of the flowers in your garden until the early spring, such as March, because many insects lay their eggs in these stems and they're waiting for the warm weather for the insect eggs to hatch and come out. So then in March, you can clean up your garden. <clears throat> then you can leave, take these stems and your brush and make a little brush pile somewhere. This is also very good for the native wildlife, for them to have shelter. When you plant natives, don't scatter a plant here and there of the same kind. Plant them in a bunch, just like buying in bulk is much more efficient than buying itty bitty cans of food. The, the birds and the butterflies and the insects would like to come to a whole patch of milkweed or a whole patch of bee balm or mountain mint or any of these other native flowering plants. So, and it gives you more impact in your garden. So you plant a whole bunch of them together and let them all live together. Then you can contact Master Gardeners for more information about native plants. In Loudoun County, Loudoun Master Gardeners would be happy to help anybody, whether you're from Virginia, Maryland, or anywhere. And their website, their email address is Loudoun, L-O-U-D-O-U-N-M-G, at vt.edu. Frederick County has Master Gardener program also. And they can be reached at their phone number 301-600-1594. And I thank you for listening to my presentation today and I wish you lots of luck in your gardening endeavors.